Thank you very much. I appreciate Dr. Sheehan the opportunity to join with the Ryan family for a few moments to reflect on the Emancipation Proclamation. As you all know, it was 150 years ago last year that the Emancipation Proclamation issued. So we aren't all together tardy in recognizing this uh, anniversary of 150 years. In fact, we wouldn't be tardy at any time because it will always be important to remember the principles which inform the Emancipation Proclamation. And they aren't altogether intuitive, which is the reason for my taking the time to share these reflections with you. Let me start with an observation that will perhaps not be intuitive. Never in the history of the United States has any person legally acknowledged to be free ever been reduced to slavery. Now that's not necessarily intuitive given our historical sense. We tend to be apprehensive about the history of the country and what transpired in the country. But that little fact is an important fact as even the current movie sensation 12 Years a Slave will make known. I'll return to that observation later and explain why it's important. But before I do that, I want to share a letter written by Abraham Lincoln, August 22nd, 1862, to Horace Greeley. I say a letter written to Horace Greeley. Formally, it was written to Horace Greeley, I suppose, though it was actually intended for publication in the New York Tribune, Greeley's paper, as it was. And it was a reply to a letter to Lincoln from Horace Greeley, which was actually not a letter sent to Lincoln, but an editorial in the same newspaper a few days earlier. So this was a very public exchange between Greeley and Lincoln. And it evoked from Lincoln this relatively short response to Greeley's letter complaining about Lincoln's tardiness in moving towards emancipation. Lincoln says, Dear Sir, I have just read yours of the 19th addressed to myself through the New York Tribune. If there be in it any statements or assumptions of fact which I may know to be erroneous, I do not now and here controvert them. If there be in it any inference which I may believe to be falsely drawn, I do not now and here argue against them. If there be perceptible in it an impatient and dictatorial tone, I waive it in deference to an old friend whose heart I have always supposed to be right. As to the policy I seem to be pursuing, quoting from Greeley's letter, as you say, I have not meant to leave anyone in doubt. I would save the Union. I would save it the shortest way under the Constitution. The sooner the national authority can be restored, the nearer the Union will be, the Union as it was. If there be those who would not save the Union unless they could at the same time save slavery, I do not agree with them. If there be those who would not save the Union unless they could at the same time destroy slavery, I do not agree with them. My paramount object in this struggle is to save the Union and is not either to save or to destroy slavery. If I could save the Union without freeing any slave, I would do it. And if I could save it, freeing all the slaves, I would do it. And if I could save it by freeing some and leaving others alone, I would also do that. What I do about slavery and the colored race, I do because I believe it helps to save the Union. And what I forbear, I forbear because I do not believe it would help to save the Union. I shall do less whenever I shall believe what I am doing hurts the cause, and I shall do more whenever I shall believe doing more will help the cause. I shall try to correct errors when shown to be errors, and I shall adapt new views so fast as they shall appear to be true views. That's the close of Lincoln's letter to Greeley. Interesting, of course, because 
it did contain dictatorial, false, and erroneous claims, which Lincoln very graciously refused to point out in detail and merely described in general. But it's also interesting for a much more intriguing reason than that. August 22nd, 1862, was almost to a day, a month after Lincoln had announced to his cabinet his decision to issue an Emancipation Proclamation. The Greeley letter was urging an emancipation. He was part of a building political movement demanding emancipation. Lincoln was not declaring it publicly yet, but had already committed personally to achieving the objective of the Emancipation Proclamation. Thus his letter, if I could save the Union freeing all the slaves, if I could save the Union without freeing any of the slaves, etc., belies the fact that he already knows the course he's going to follow. And it is a way, of course, of announcing in anticipation what will appear one month subsequent to August 22nd, September 22nd, 1862, when in the days following the victory at Antietam, Lincoln announces that he will issue the proclamation as of January 1st, 1863. Now, there's a story involved in all of those transactions, which has been told time and again by countless wonderful scholars. One of them is James Oakes, who's written Freedom National, who has the uh, wonderful distinction of being two times a Lincoln Prize winner. This was his second Lincoln Prize winner. It's a wonderful book. I commend it to your attention. But it's his title that's of interesting right now, Freedom National. That's a reflection of something Lincoln said more than once that it was important in the United States that we regard freedom as national and slavery as sectional. Very important that we never take slavery to be a subject of federal codes or federal legislation in the strict sense of a slave code. It had not been so from the beginning. It was not so in terms of the constitutional provisions dealing with the question of slavery other than the one provision providing for a prohibition which required legislative enforcement explicitly. And that was, of course, negative rather than positive as to the question of slavery. So freedom national, slavery sectional, was Lincoln's objective in his buildup towards what became the war, and certainly in his prosecution of the war in every step that he took. Now, what was surprising in July when Lincoln announced to his cabinet that he was going to issue an Emancipation Proclamation, was that the cabinet was surprised. They had not had advance warning. There were one or two people who subsequently claimed some degree of advance warning, but those claims are not altogether persuasive. Mostly, they sat first in stunned silence, and then in halting responses, recognizing he wasn't asking for their opinion, that he was announcing his decision. And he intended to announce it to the country as he returned the Second Confiscation Act, which had just been passed by Congress, and which he had been initially prepared to veto, but then once having won a slight concession from Congress in the language, decided he would not veto it after all. But this is one of the more interesting cases of a signing statement. In the history of the United States, you'll all remember that George Bush got into a lot of trouble with signing statements. And he was certainly given great grief by candidates for election to the office subsequently for his having taken those extraordinary uh, steps of executive power. Well, Lincoln issued a signing statement when he signed the legislation. It was a signing statement that announced that he had planned to veto it, his reasons for not vetoing it. He also had intended to include with that particular signing statement the announcement of the Emancipation Proclamation. His cabinet, in particular, Seward, persuaded him it would be a bad time to do that because the Union had had a series of tough losses and it would seem an act of desperation. <laughs> 
So they asked him to wait until they got some good news and he could then announce the Emancipation Proclamation from a position of strength rather than weakness. Lincoln allowed us how that seemed very prudent, very reasonable, and therefore he would embrace that approach. That is why on August 22nd, he could not yet announce to Horace Greeley and the country the decision he had already made. Though his language on August 22nd conveys that he's ready to do it. If it would save the Union. He had already decided it would save the Union. Not only had he made that decision, but he had long paved the way for it. He had produced, through the works of Francis Lieber, the political philosopher, a new code of war founded in international law, reading of international law, and developing the theory of emancipation as an act of military necessity so that the groundwork had been fully laid. The original code of war in the United States was this code of war developed by Lieber and ultimately implemented by Lincoln. And in it, laying forth the grounds for taking as an act of military necessity the step of emancipation. Now remember, the Emancipation Proclamation is a carefully calibrated act. It is not a universal act of emancipation. For at the same time, Lincoln had been making the attempt to persuade the non-seceding slave states to emancipate voluntarily and gradually. He had proposed compensated emancipation, which was a program by which the federal government would pay for the emancipation of those slaves, not by the slaves. Mind you, that's a very important fact to observe. The federal government wasn't offering to buy the slaves, only to compensate those slaveholders in the border states who would set their slaves free. For Lincoln, that was a military strategy, for it was important that they not be one to the side of the Confederacy. Had Kentucky gone over, had West Virginia gone over, had Missouri gone fully over, he did not think the Union could prevail. So that across that whole swath over to Maryland and Delaware, there was a series of states he was fighting manfully to hold in the Union, even though they still held slaves. And he wanted nothing to interfere with that, including general propositions of emancipation, which of course the slaveholders in those border states might take as reflecting upon them negatively and encourage them to join in the abandonment of the Union, which was uh, significant of the Confederacy itself. So Lincoln's policy was being developed in a context in which there was great push and pull. There was the great push of strategy, thinking about how to get through this most effectively, most safely. There was a great pull of political activism on both sides. Lincoln's armies were headed by a general. His name, George B. McClellan. When in the letter of August 22nd, he refers to those who would save the Union only if they could save slavery, he meant McClellan. That was McClellan's position from the beginning. And he clung to it throughout the war. In fact, he clung to it so tightly that he became the nominee of the Democrat Party in the election of 1864 on that very platform. So Lincoln had a push from his right, we might say. And he had a push from his left, those who were demanding emancipation. And in fact, this is so complicated, the story of emancipation, that many people actually believe that Lincoln was pushed into the Emancipation Proclamation rather than seeing it as a deliberate act fulfilling a long series of steps tending ineluctably in that direction, as indeed was the case. Alan Guelso has a new book on the Lincoln and the Emancipation, uh, a wonderful, wonderful book, an excellent book, in which he describes Lincoln's prudence and defends Lincoln's position in the Emancipation Proclamation story as from the perspective 
of taking the prudent position throughout, doing what was necessary and no more, stage by stage, step by step, to work slowly towards the end. And it's a strongly creditable view. It has in it much to recommend it, and much like the Oaks book, very worth reading. But there is something missing even in that prudence. Because as I said, when it came to the meeting in July, when Lincoln was prepared to announce the Emancipation Proclamation already, it was the prudence of Seward who ruled him, not his own prudence, and led him to wait until after the victory at Antietam. There's a little bit something more than Lincoln's prudence that enters into this story. And for that, we need to go back a bit. We need to recapture some historical sense. That historical sense begins with the Revolutionary War. The Revolutionary War did what wars always do with respect to populations in which slavery plays a significant role. It offers an opportunity for the slaves to escape and in some cases, outwardly to rebel. It's not unnatural in the case of war to think that slaves would see here, finally, an opportunity to strike for freedom. And so they did in the Revolutionary War. Some actually fought on the side of the British. I know we like to tell the tales about those who fought on the side of the Americans for freedom, but there were also some who fought on the side of the British. There were many more who fled to British ships and behind British lines seeking freedom, and who in fact gained that freedom. The British had already adopted by this point the position that came through the Somerset ruling, namely that free soil operates freedom. Whoever lands on British soil gains but thereby freedom and they can never be returned to slavery. Which means that when the British went through the Chesapeake, when they sailed along Savannah and off the coast of Charleston and up into the waters of Southern Virginia, and they attracted slaves to those ships, and many of them were carried away, whether to the islands or back to Britain itself, they were actually liberating these slaves from their perspective, as opposed to stealing property. Because that's something else that always happens in war, yes? That combatants tend to make free with the enemy's property. They use it to subsist their armies in the field, as need may be. They use it to take away the material of war from the enemy and to strengthen their own material. And all property is subject to that degree of confiscation. In war, it's not a surprise. And that, therefore, that property which is human would fall into the same category, would be the most natural thing in the world, except in the Revolutionary War because this takes place in a particular context in which the human property gains its freedom and therefore is not taken as property by the British enemy. It changes everything. So when, in the Treaty of Paris of 1783, the United States extracted from the British the pledge to compensate for property taken away and expected fully compensation for the slaves. It created a massive difficulty. That treaty was, of course, slow in being in force. Slow because the British did not evacuate the post in the western United States, now of the Midwest, of course. And slow because the American states that formed in the aftermath of the war were slow in dealing with the obligations to the Tories who had fled from North America or from the United States to Canada. Slow because many of the terms of the treaty had not been fulfilled. And one of those unfulfilled terms was a term dealing with the return or compensation for slaves carried away. When finally, in 1795, under George Washington's leadership, John Jay traveled to Britain and negotiated a follow-on treaty, which we call the Jay Treaty, finally to implement the Treaty of Paris. The treaty was brought back by Jay without a word on the question of slave compensation. 
All other forms of compensation were included. That was excluded. It was excluded according to Alexander Hamilton, who at George Washington's request published a long series of essays in defense of that treaty, because it one, was counter to morality and natural right to return free people to slavery, to reduce free people to slavery. They chose, in other words, not to do it. Choosing, therefore, not to establish the federal government on the side of producing slavery and producing laws that defended slavery. That was, of course, why the treaty, the Jay Treaty, was so vigorously uh, opposed by the Democratic Republicans and primarily by their Southern members, and why it barely squeaked by after a very lengthy campaign on the part of Washington and Hamilton. Nevertheless, it did squeak by, it was approved, and it did establish that principle. A principle which reappears in 1807, when finally the 20 year term has expired and it's time for Congress to outlaw the foreign slave trade, and Congress moves readily, steadily in that direction without opposition, but making the mistake of providing punishment for those who were apprehended carrying on the illegal trade, the prohibited trade. And they did so, Madison having authored this legislation in the State Department, using typical boilerplate language dealing with smuggling. Namely, they provided for the disposition of contraband when it's taken. You provide punishment for those who are the smugglers, and you must provide for doing something with the property they were smuggling, the contraband. When the contraband turns out to be people, creates a special kind of problem, which was shortly brought to the attention of the members of Congress. Are you really serious that you're going to sell people in the name of prohibiting the foreign slave trade? Does that make sense? And happily, we may say, they immediately saw the truth of the matter and saw that it did not make sense. And so they backed off of that. Now that, of course, caused impenetrable difficulties they were unable to figure out what to do if they couldn't do that. Because, you see, the people would now be here in the United States. You would have little or no idea of where they actually came from. Getting the power to return them would have been very difficult and costly. Even the enforcement of the prohibition was beyond the reach of the United States. The United States actually relied upon the British Navy to uh, to enforce this prohibition of the foreign slave trade because it did not have the capability of doing that at the time. So you couldn't send them back to Africa. You could not colonize them somewhere on their own. What were you going to do? Theoretically, turn them loose wherever they are and call them free. <laughs> Except where they're likely to be is the place they were being smuggled into originally which means you would be asking the slaveholding states with slave codes at the municipal level to receive boatloads of free people undermining their institution of slavery. And when those people suggested to the northerners, well, why don't you take them? The northern response was, wait a minute, we're opposed to slavery, but that doesn't mean that we want to embrace Africans being sent wholesale into our communities. No, wait, thank you, we don't create it and we don't want to receive the problem. And they finally resolved the problem simply by saying, we'll leave it to be determined in the jurisdiction where they find themselves how they will be treated. You can imagine what that produced as a result. But it kept the national laws clean, historically speaking. The national legislation did not have to engender a slave code. It did not have to produce regulations governing slavery, the rights of slaveholders, or the conditions of slaves. So that stilled the waters. But it wasn't for very long, because by 1812, we were at war again with the same enemy, Britain. And this time, the war far more aggressively liberated slaves. The British ran real campaigns up and down the Chesapeake reaching out to plantations saying, come, 
They did so throughout the Gulf, the Gulf of Mexico. They did so around Florida on both sides of the coast, the Atlantic and the Gulf Coast. And many, many slaves made overland treks down through Georgia into Florida, where the Spanish were, trying to find some route towards liberty. So it was a big deal during the War of 1812 that what had opened up was a route to freedom for the slaves. Once again, the war closes with a treaty, the Treaty of Ghent, 1814-15. Once again, the treaty provides for compensation for slaves. Once again, it was very difficult to enforce the treaty. However, the Madison Monroe Adams Troika, Madison and Monroe with Monroe as Secretary of State, then Monroe as President with Adams as Secretary of State, do finally comply with the treaty, but only after calling in the Tsar of Russia to mediate and arbitrate and therefore enforce a ruling. It was extremely difficult. But think about how this ruling happens. It comes finally in 1822. That's how long it takes to bring to fruition that promise in the treaty. That same treaty included a provision, it's Article 14, for the British to join with the United States in toughening the prohibition against the foreign slave trade, as a result of which capital punishment came into effect on both sides for those participating in the foreign slave trade. But this particular compensation takes place also in the immediate circumstances and aftermath of the Missouri Compromise. It was the Missouri Compromise that makes legal, in effect, the standard Freedom National Slavery Sectional. So even though we now have acted on a treaty commitment that implies the necessity for some kind of federal law dealing with slavery. The law is not forthcoming. The compensation is indirect. No slaves are actually returned. That's the bottom line. The British held out not to return any individuals, and the compensation was indirect rather than direct. So the country remained unstained. Never was someone legally recognized free ever reduced to slavery. And it was that regime, as it was thus constituted, that was preserved until 1854 in the Kansas-Nebraska crisis. There were implications in 1850, I won't go into all of those, but some people thought that the Missouri Compromise had already been overturned in 1850 in the Fugitive Slave Law. But certainly by 1854, that was made explicit and to say you're overturning the Missouri Compromise, by which, for those of you who are not immediately familiar, it means that there was a rule established that you would not uh, allow the balance of slave and free states to change. So as you admitted a new state that was free or slave, you had to admit one of the opposite kind as well, indefinitely. Preserving, therefore, marginal advantage to the free states in defining the character of the nation rather than yielding that to the slave states. So in 1854, when that compromise was repealed by the Kansas-Nebraska Act, it seemed to one politician that the United States had crossed a critical line, a line which changed its entire historical trajectory and which threatened utterly to destroy it. And that politician was someone who had been quiet who had stepped aside from politics for several years prior to that time, but who now returned with a burst of energy on the scene. And that was Abraham Lincoln, who reacted to the Kansas-Nebraska Act with stinging arguments against it, with condemnatory descriptions of its tendency to make slavery national, and therefore to destroy freedom. So Lincoln starts out in his Peoria speech in 1854, building his case for freedom national, slavery sectional, suggesting that we needed to reverse the damage done in the Kansas-Nebraska Act, and then sustaining his campaign all the way through his attacks on the Dred Scott decision, which followed, of course, three years later, and which had finally accomplished, from Lincoln's point of view, what the Kansas-Nebraska Act threatened which was to open every state in the Union to slavery. 
making it impossible for them, whether they nominally had preferred free constitutions or not, ever to insist upon keeping slavery out. The argument was that the federal government had no power to obstruct the free flow of citizens of the United States into any state in the Union carrying all their property with them. And those who had slave property had as much right to go into Massachusetts and keep their property as they had to remain in their respective states. To Lincoln, that was the formula that made slavery national and therefore destroyed freedom. So Lincoln's campaign was predicated on reestablishing the rule of freedom national, slavery sectional. This is why he ran for president with the campaign that I intend to do nothing to disturb slavery where it exists. He repeated over and over again, I make no threat to slavery where it exists, but I stand firm against its extension into any new territories or states, and I stand firm against that interpretation that opens every state to the spread of slavery. For Lincoln actually thought the very future of the nation depended upon that resolution. And of course, to all appearances, one would have to conclude he was probably correct. But it is this underlying motif that best explains what happens with the Emancipation Proclamation, as it turns out. Abraham Lincoln saw, from the first days of the war, an emerging problem. The first part of that problem was, of course, the whole question of the contraband. There was a Union general who had received slaves into the Army post, in Southern Virginia at this point, and therefore liberated them, just as happened in the Revolutionary War, in the War of 1812. One could liberate the enemy's property, as it were. And in these first hours, the general who was enforcing this particular policy referred to the slaves as contraband. That became their popular name throughout the country, contraband. And there are, there's a wonderful painting about, of that, by the way, which I didn't think to bring and put up for you. But uh, you may look it up, and you will find it. Lincoln and the Contrabands is the title. And you will find it absolutely delightful to contemplate. But, the, uh, the fact that they were called contraband itself created a problem. So that in the first Confiscation Act that was passed in 1861, what you have is Congress giving legal authority to the Union Army, the Union military forces, to confiscate enemy property. Even though these, this enemy now is not another country. You must remember that they had to dance on the head of a pin as to whether the Confederacy were a separate nation, or whether it was just Americans in a state of rebellion. And certain things you could do only to another nation, and then you couldn't do them to your own citizens in the state of rebellion. And this certainly involved the whole question of confiscation, which was subject, among other things, for example, to the limitation of attainder. The Constitution bans bills of attainder. Bills of attainder are those provisions that deprive individuals of their property and entail that deprivation through succeeding generations, through all heirs and assigns. This is banned by the Constitution. This is one of the objections Lincoln had to the Second Confiscation Act, is this is just not right. Because then he was thinking of them as citizens, not as a foreign nation. But when he imposed a boycott, a naval boycott, on the Confederacy, that was treating them as a foreign nation. You don't boycott your own nation. <laughs> you don't embargo your own nation. You do that on foreign nations. So that it was back and forth, this dancing on the head of the pin, which shall it be? Congress in the first Confiscation Act essentially is authorizing the treatment of the slaves as property, but without having provided the follow through that defined what you do with the property. So we needed a second Confiscation Act, which came the very next year, 1862. Congress spent the time from roughly April to July, early July, shaping and forming that legislation. Legislation which virtually comes to the point of demanding an Emancipation Proclamation. It demands that the President enforce the act by issuing a proclamation, 
and it describes the fate of confiscated property when it takes the form of human property as being subject to emancipation. So it's beginning to deal with the problem. If you take the property as property, you have to then engender codes for it. If you don't take it as property, you don't need to engender codes. It didn't completely resolve the outstanding issues, but we saw movement in the direction that Lincoln was most concerned with. At the same time, we had this code which had come into play, and that was ready by the first of the year in 1862, the military code that Lieber had developed. And what the president was looking at was the dual decision of how to induce military pressure on the uh, Confederacy and at the same time how to accomplish the objective of ridding to the extent possible the country of slavery. For we must make no doubt about it, the president never wavered from an ultimate goal of ending slavery. The Emancipation Proclamation did not declare that goal, but it took a long step in that direction. And it begins by eliminating the practical problem of needing to deal with slaves as property in federal law. This was not accomplished in either Confiscation Act. It was not accomplished in any <laughs> legal ruling. It was accomplished only by the Emancipation Proclamation. Let's put that in context also. Beginning in Missouri, early in the war, where there was General Fremont in charge, General Fremont took it upon himself to issue Emancipation Proclamations. And the President had to force the withdrawal of those proclamations and insist that he alone would exercise the authority, the power, to proclaim emancipation. He found himself doing the same thing elsewhere with generals on the front in Georgia and Alabama who started the process of issuing proclamations and he had to force them to recall them. Hunter had to recall his. So that Lincoln was all the time balancing against these pressures, these forces, wanting to precipitate action in these areas while reserving for himself the right to act when it was militarily appropriate and also when it could accomplish a legal objective. And so, when finally he says to his cabinet, July of 1862, I am going to issue an Emancipation Proclamation, what Lincoln is announcing is that he's found the solution to the biggest problem. And if you go back to the Emancipation Proclamation that is finally issued, January 1st, 1863, you can see what's really characteristic of it more than anything else is how prosaic it is. It is not a question of high-flying poetry. There's no uh, great moral sentiment expressed in it. It does a very simple thing. It emancipates slaves in the states now in rebellion and emancipates them once and for all. And it just closes with that. It means, of course, that they now confront a particularly difficult reality militarily. Not only do they serve to turn this human property into further objects of, or further uh, instruments of warfare against themselves, but of course, they're never going to recover either the slaves or their value. And this puts a pressure on them to bring an end to this war as soon as possible. Uh, they're not gonna get the slaves even if they do end if they were in rebellion at the time of the issuance of the emancipation. But the longer they go on, and the more of the territory they bring under rebellion, the more they will suffer consequences of this. Lincoln, I believe, in making this decision, was carrying out a specific legal duty. And so this brings us to the title of this talk. I want to remind you of the oath the president swears. I do solemnly swear or affirm that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same, that I take this obligation freely, without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion, and that I will well and faithfully discharge the duties of the office on which I'm about to enter. So help me God. That is the oath every other officer of government takes, vice president on down, legislatively prescribed, not constitutionally prescribed. The constitutional oath 
only the president takes, and it reads this way. I do solemnly swear or affirm that I will faithfully execute the office of the President of the United States and will, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. Now, what I'm suggesting is that the difference we can see between the oath to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution, on the one hand, and the oath to support and defend the Constitution against all enemies, et cetera, on the other hand, is that the presidential oath carries with it a measure of legal compulsion. The president, in his title, his role as president, not by medium of the courts, not by medium of the Congress, but on his own, is called upon to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution. And that includes defending its purity, defending the national law, as it were, against corruptions that would insidiously undermine it. And that's the case with the need for the Emancipation Proclamation. For if it ever befell that it were necessary to engender a slave code under the Constitution, that would have been devastating, destructive, in the most serious fashion. And that that was Lincoln's concern above all else. Yes, Lincoln cared about liberty for the slaves. He spoke of it too often for us to doubt it. But that was not the goal in mind of the Emancipation Proclamation. When he said he would save the Union, he meant it. But he meant it not as a mere outcome of military activities. He meant it as a series of legal and military activities sustaining understanding of what was at stake for the country as a whole. That meant that we could not have contraband that was human. We could not return people to slavery once they had gained freedom. Although slavery was strictly the uh, creation of municipal law, law at the state, the local level, and there was nothing the federal government could do about it in terms of interfering with it. The federal government could certainly, by keeping it thus cabined as municipal law, could insulate federal law from its influence. And this was Lincoln's goal, to make certain that federal law was always insulated from the influence of slavery. And that alone keeps alive the power of the Constitution as an instrumentality against the institution of slavery. So if you ask the question, given the Emancipation Proclamation, why was a 15th Amendment to the Constitution necessary? Why, pardon me, a 13th Amendment to the Constitution necessary? Why, why was that? Well, it was because, in fact, we only emancipated in the territories under rebellion to begin with, so it was not universal emancipation. But more importantly, the act of the president does not establish uniform law. It was an act of military necessity. It was an act intended to be permanent. But to secure it against judicial interpretation, to secure it against legislative intervention subsequently, a, fifth, a 13th Amendment was absolutely necessary. And so Lincoln poured himself into winning approval of the 13th Amendment once the war was headed towards a successful conclusion. It took the Emancipation Proclamation to get headed in that direction. It established the legal principle that was reaffirmed in the 13th Amendment. But it took the 13th Amendment, finally, to put the seal to the deal. So Lincoln acted to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution when he acted to emancipate the slaves. Your questions are in order. <laughs>